The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is Technology Additions, Tips on Implementing New Software, and I'll introduce our speaker and panelists shortly. Next slide. A quick disclaimer before we get started, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated, the contractors and our speakers' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent U.S. Administration for Community Living uh, official federal government policy. Next slide. A little note about our APS TARC, although I suspect everybody on the phone is pretty familiar with it, but we're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us at any time. There'll be some contact info displayed at the end of the webinar. We have um, special funds allocated to helping formula grantees. So everybody on this call um, or on this webinar has you know, even extra support. Um, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. Um, I think these calls are especially helpful for formula grantees, especially the one at the end of each month. You see there the administrator's manager's call, which is the fourth Wednesday of each month. But we do have three calls per month, one for investigators, one for supervisors, and then that last one I mentioned for administrators. Uh, the schedule for these calls is on your screen, but you can also get this schedule on our website, um, which you'll see the information at the end of the, the um, of the webinar and you can contact us if you'd like to subscribe to our listserv and register for these calls each month. They can be very helpful. Talk to other administrators. Uh, next slide. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's slides will be posted at a later date along with the recording of today's webinar. All participants are muted for this webinar and you can use your computer or telephone to access audio. Please adjust the volume to your desired level. If you have any problems with the audio or viewing the presentation, we recommend that you exit the webinar and then re-enter. That often fixes whatever issues are popping up. Um, next slide. If you have questions of our presenters, simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll pause for questions at the end and we'll get to as many of them as possible, but you do not have to wait till the end. You can type your questions whenever they occur to you and we will get to them. The session is being recorded and it will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify via email everybody who's registered and all the formula grantees when this is posted online. Also, you'll receive an automatically generated email in 24 hours with a link to a certificate of attendance just in case you would like to hold on to that. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce today's speakers and a couple of panelists that we have. Um, our primary speaker is Philip Calloway, who's a business analyst and consultant with the Office of Information and Resource Management at the Administration for Community Living, and he's also the APS Tech, APS TARC technology subject matter expert. Philip's been involved in a variety of technology initiatives over his many years. You may be working with Philip individually if you request technical assistance from the APS TARC. And then we also have a couple of panelists today who we'll hear from a bit later. Both are with the state of Massachusetts at the Disabled Persons Protection Commission, or DPPC. We have Heidi Cresta, the Director of Quality Assurance, and Jean Freyjust, who's the Director of Information Technology. Again, you'll hear from them closer to the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Philip Calloway. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Andrew stated, I am a business analyst and a technology consultant for um, OIRM and with ACLIT. I'm excited to work with APS Technical Assistance Resource Center um, as a subject matter expert in technology. Um, I want to make it clear I'm not an APS process or operations expert. I'm here for uh, uh, technology support. Uh, some of the language that, uh, that I actually may uh, have may be different from what you're used to. However, we are working together to simplify this and help you understand technology solutions. So if there is a term or a process that you need further clarity on, jot it down and ask your question uh, during the question and answer. 
we do have APS process resources on the line in case there's a process uh, clarity that's needed. Uh, my background is in software implementations and big data. I worked uh, as an IT consultant on projects with WMATA, the NSA, Citigroup, and HSBC. In addition, I've completed nine lifecycle in, um, software implementations and three upgrades. Uh, I'm here to advise and to help. So there are a couple of takeaways that I want you to uh, to, to to note. Um, next slide. Our learning objectives here are to find your team, um, identify the roles and the key players that you uh, need to be successful, uh, then to define your success, create a plan, a timeline, and a budget, clearly define your process, establish your requirements, um, uh, review your data, revisit your plan and track your progress. Next slide. So finding your team, give some thought on who you'll be partnering with, with uh, to complete your, your task in terms of, of implementing your software. Um, I'm not familiar with the APS acquisition process. However, I've been told uh, by our team that it should be a major emphasis on getting to know your local acquisition partner. You should familiarize yourself with this process also to make sure that uh, you have a lot of enough, enough time for uh, for this process to take to take hold. Sometimes it can be longer than you expect. Also, in the same context, uh, someone will have to help install and implement uh, and integrate the software for you. Don't panic. Uh, this should be your local IT department. Uh, you should also find a partner there. Familiarize yourself with your local IT department. Um, you're responsible for identifying your IT partner, and uh, you don't have to worry about actually doing the uh, the install. So start making these relationships. So you have project roles and you have system roles. Uh, the project roles would be like your project manager, your subject matter expert. That would be the person that actually knows about your processes, or like your operations, um, and then also your IT leader, um, your director or, or IT manager and a developer. On the system side, you would need to know like who's going to be the person that is going to be training, um, who should be trained, who's going to run your reports, um, and will you need new roles created. For example, uh, you, may, you may not have a super user, but you, need, you may need a super user for this particular software or a team lead. Next slide. Define success. So, before you take the big leap in uh, choosing and implementing a technology solution, define what you want the product to, uh, what you want to get from the product. Uh, at minimum, what is the solution required for you to do for you? So, if some of you guys may have just wanted to capture data. You may have want the ability to have it to put, uh, have input data from computers, or not just computers, maybe even handheld devices, tablets, and phones. Uh, create reports, uh, push notifications to users. So define what you actually would, um, once the the, uh, the software is implemented, what, do you, what would you call success? Again, I'm not an APS software expert, but defining your success is key to defining your scope. So um, the scope is also a piece of uh, something that you should look at in the functions of, uh, of the software. So your core functions are something that you should look at. What functions should the software cover? Um, maybe mobile features, photo capturing, documentation management, maybe metrics. Those are some of the things that you may want to take uh, in consideration. So you probably won't get everything you want. However, um, I'm being told with, uh, uh, from your, your resource center, get as close to acceptable in, uh, as you can. You won't get everything, but you might just get, uh, get close to, uh, to acceptable. So, in the same instance, um, uh, some things could be pushed to the back of the line, some features or some functions. So in the same, same instance, you could say, okay, I can get um, photo capturing and documentation management. Uh, I want metrics. However, um, I don't have time to do it or I don't have uh, the, the, the staff to do it. So we can implement that at another time. This is called a phased approach. So you could break things into phases. You might not get um, your 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 all everything in the first phase, but I would suggest you 
uh, break it into phases so that you can um, put it where you have your optimal times for your, your staff and your resources. Next slide. I'm considering creating a plan. So your, your timeline is actually your plan. Um, your timeline is a document uh, is documented and called the project plan. Uh, you can detail your project plan or get help from your IT department to do that. Planning this work is, and executing the tasks are paramount to your success. Once you execute, me execute measuring and documenting the work completed will help in assessing the health of your project. So we have here, we have um, milestones. Um, a milestone is a marker in your timeline that accents a certain goal. So these should be achievable and realistic. In the same instance, tasks should be, um, uh, be timed and adjusted to meet your need. So sometimes you have high volume seasons of work and your resources are constraints are, are constrained or, or you'll have a high vacation time or holiday time. That should be uh, considered when you are actually um, putting together your, your timeline or your, in your project. Another thing that you should take in consideration is budget and funding. This is um, included in your, your, in, your, in your planning. So uh, sometimes there are priority conflicts. Sometimes there are things that uh, take priority over your actual uh, tasks. So you can, should consider this as part of your funding and budgeting. With budgeting, you should also look at the licensing. If, you, if you're getting software that requires licensing, uh, you, sh you should examine the sometimes uh, licensing may actually, sometimes licensing actually uh, has uh, what the first year for licensing, the fees will be minimal, but the second year they will double. So in that same instance, you would, you would look at uh, the total cost of licensing. I would inquire about licensing over a three to seven year period. So um, licensing is one piece of it. And then the next piece we look at is examining the total cost of ownership for the solution. So the total cost is included, um, includes things like service enhancements and maintenance. Let's just say that you have mapped your, your product to um, your processes and you've started uh, to use it and you realize you, for, you need um, two more fields or a uh, law changes and you, you say, let's say your, the, uh, the laws or some rules of, of your local um, uh, entity changes and you have to create four or five more fields, um, they're, they're needed for your, your software. So those things that you have to con uh, consider and budget for um, in your plan. Next slide. Define your process. So here's where sometimes it's um, we, we we require um, the help of what we call our subject matter experts or someone in operations to jump in and look at our procedures and um, and get a consensus on what our requirements are. Write your requirements out and make sure that they are um, are are pretty uh, solid with your operations leaders. Um, then you want to map your requirements to uh, the technology solution. So whatever software you decide to, to choose, you want to be able to look at the functionality of that particular software and make sure that meets your need in terms of the requirements that you have and the procedures that you, and operations that you use. Um, this may be, um, may be the time that you review some of your processes and your procedures and say, okay, we did want to uh, change something up or we, we did want to um, streamline some things, this may be the time for you to actually do that particular thing in terms of streamlining your processes. Next slide. Review your data. Your data is a big piece of, uh, of your implementation. So um, you need to clean your data up and review your reports. So if your current uh, system is, is uh, has reporting, you need to look at your current reports and see, okay, um, see the life cycle of these reports. Some of some reports may be outdated and old and may not have been used for a while. And uh, some data may be, um, you, some of us know that our data has is not, um, uh, there's bad data in our, in our system. So I would suggest to take a quick look at your data um, and clean it up. And uh, for the new system, you should establish rules that will allow uh, minimizing uh, uh, the input of bad data. So when you do that, uh, that's called edits and standards. 
So if a user goes in and gets ready to input a, a city and he misspells the city, um, the, the system will not take the name because he is, there's an edit there that requires him to put the correct city name in or it actually gets to choose the city, he has to choose the city from a list. You can do that. Um, so edits and standards for your data, clean up your data, and also look at your reports, uh, reconcile your, your reports to make sure that they meet your retention policies and even whatever your, uh, your retention policy is, even if you, you, you decide that you need, you still wanna bring it forward, make sure you're not bringing forward bad data. All right, next slide. Uh, track your progress. So once you've done all this, you've, you've um, got your plan in, in place, you've got your requirements in place, you know what the software that you're going to, um, uh, to, to, to purchase and you're gonna, you've mapped your, your software to that particular, to your particular um, uh, operation functions. Uh, you wanna look at, do um, uh, you wanna track what you've mapped? So, so you create tasks uh, and you task those once you have your tasks. Um, put the plan, put those to the plan, map those to your plan. So your project plan should include the tasks uh, that will require uh, for you to implement the software. And uh, breaking out the tasks and getting updates is called status reporting. This will assess you, help you assist you in measuring your, the health of your project. So when, once you actually have your, your um, task and your, uh, and your status reporting together, you would continuously monitor your, your plan. So don't think that just because um, you, know, you have a delay, every, every project will have a delay. Every project will have something that's unknown and, uh, and every project will have resource constraints. So you should also build time in for those particular things. And even if you haven't built time in, uh, you should plan for that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator and uh, we will go to our panel. All right, and I think we had some questions of our panelists. Um, and I believe those are on the next slide, is that right? Yes. Okay, and Philip, I will let you ask these questions of our panelists, um, Gene sure. and Heidi. So Gene and Heidi, um, I think Heidi Cresta is an operations leader and Gene is a um, IT director, am I correct? That is correct, Philip. All right, so what technology solution did you implement? Heidi? Sure, I'll go. So we actually um, have purchased and designed a custom solution. We did not buy an off-the-shelf product. Um, we have been working for the past three years on a custom database for our needs. And we use uh, a software called FileMaker Pro. Um, it is a software that's known for its flexibility and ease of use. It's actually owned by a subsidiary of Apple. Uh, and it is actually the same software that we have used. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with DPPC, we are um, an APS agency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but we're a little bit of a different animal than most APS agencies in that we um, kind of fill the gap between child protective services and elder protective services. And we um, only work with a population between 18 and 59 that have a disability. So Massachusetts has a bifurcated system in that there is the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and the DPPC and we operate independently. So DPPC was established in 1987, and at that time we had what I would call a homegrown database. It was um, created by uh, a staff member of the DPPC who had no IT experience <laughs> and used the FileMaker product to um, develop our database way back when. But back in the late 80s, FileMaker uh, was not had no real relational capabilities. It was originally a DOS application. So it wasn't until I think the mid 90s that FileMaker introduced some new relational and scripting features, but DPPC did not have the money nor the manpower to rebuild at that time. And um, when we were fortunately awarded this grant three years ago, 
we decided that we were going to, from the ground up, rebuild our database. We started from scratch and we did a lot of research before we decided to, to retain the FileMaker product. And, you know, Jean can probably jump in a little bit too. It was not an, a decision that we took easily. Um, but we did stick with FileMaker. I don't know, Gene, if you have anything to add to that. Yes, I certainly do. Thank you, Heidi. Um, FileMaker was really the best, the best solution, the best custom solution for our organization. Heidi spoke about um, looking at other products, which we did visit. Um, however, we needed to select a product that would meet our operational needs that would really be geared towards uh, our business, the way we conduct business, and simply buying an off-the-shelf solution and changing the way we um, do our business to fit that um, just wasn't a viable option for us. Um, so far, FileMaker has worked fantastically. Um, and as we continue building and nearing the completion of our build, um, any additional changes that we're requesting now, having the flexibility to just go in and make it and not having to wait for a, a um, you know, a maintenance period um, or, you know, as Heidi mentioned, with it being so easy um, to, de develop, to develop on the surface, if you needed to make a, a, a simple change, you can go ahead and do that. And it's not a heavy lift where you would need um, the experience of an advanced developer on site or so much of an advanced IT specialist who focuses on database development because FileMaker allows you to um, manage changes right on the surface and that will propagate, that will propagate its changes down uh, without having to lift um, a, a heavy finger, I should suggest. Um, but yeah, but certainly that's the solution we went with and it was the best solution for the needs of our organization, the needs of our business. And um, I'm really happy we made that choice uh, looking at looking at it on the other side now that we're nearing completion. Because as we go into some of our second, our next question is there were challenges along the way. But now that we're at the tail end of this project, we can look back and say, wow, there wouldn't be any other product um, that we could have buy off the shelf that would have been able to meet the needs uh, of uh, the way FileMaker is meeting the needs for, for our agency. That's wonderful to hear. And uh, you jumped in and, and we started talking about challenges. So I'll stay with, with you, Jane. What, what are some of the challenges? And, and Heidi, I would expect you to, to jump in after. What are some of the challenges you came across? Yes, yeah, certainly. From a, from a technology standpoint, um, you know, our, our system is, is probably a lot different than yours. And Heidi can speak about how, 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 how we differ in a way. But from a, from a tech side, uh, my IT model is sort of decentralized. Uh, we had to um, rely heavily on some of the state systems, state IT systems to propagate um, access down to us. So it really delayed some of the um, the changes that we could have made and how quickly we could have made them because the central IT needs to um, oversee um, connections to their, you know, Amazon a web space. Um, sometimes there was issues in, the, in, in, in getting uh, firewalls to open up. Um, and, and, and completing the connection between an Amazon server with an insight location that is separate from headquarters, which is miles away from where we are. There was just a little bit of a challenges through that, but overall, if that wasn't in the way, I believe um, the connection would have been a lot more seamless. Also, um, you know, we were deciding whether to go from a, a Linux insta instance of FileMaker versus a Windows instance of FileMaker. And, and, and what does that mean in terms of the availability of the product, the availability to back up the product and restore it? Um, I hope this, this technical jargon doesn't throw you off too much, but just from a, from a, from a, a cent centralized IT model, if we didn't have to go through an additional middleman to get what we needed to get done, it would have been one of the, uh, um, it would have been an, a point that we could have striked off knowing that like that integration would have been a lot more seamless for us. Um, Heidi, do you want to talk a little bit more about like um, how our system might be a little disjointed compared to sure. others? Sure, and I think probably one of the biggest challenges that we faced is you know, just to refer back to how I described DPPC structure. So DPPC is an independent agency, but we have three other agencies within the Commonwealth that act, actually act as our agents and they conduct investigations under our statutory jurisdiction. So while their investigators may act as our agents and they are conducting investigations for us, they're not our employees. 
and they are different agencies and they have their own systems. So for us to buy a product and expect that all of that pool of investigators would buy into that product was was not possible because they are in fact three other agencies. So we needed to take that into consideration um, in our design. In our design when we were choosing a product and also realizing some of the limitations because mm -hmm. The other three agencies do not use FileMaker like we do. They are not using our database. They do use it um, in in another in another manner. And I guess I I'll, I'll kind of speak a little bit to another challenge, and that is scope creep. Everybody should be prepared for scope creep. Um, you need to do a really thorough discovery when you first start the project but I can pretty much guarantee you that you won't think of everything. <laughs> um, yeah. you underestimate your needs, right, Gene? That's absolutely correct. Um, you know, factor in for scope creep, whatever you're factoring, maybe double or triple it because it's gonna happen. You, you may think you know everything you need to know to go in and to make this project successful, but the reality is, as you dive in further, you're going to get introduced to new features, new ideas, new bells and whistles. And there's going to be parts of the project that are going to challenge what you think you know. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's going to make you want to think about things differently. And as you start to think differently, you start to rewrite your procedures. You know, I, I, I put down a line that says to, to revisit and rewrite and return to all of your operational procedures. Um, as, as quickly as you can as you go into a project like this because um, the, the the project is going to challenge everything that you know all right so um, just just in, in combination with the scope creep it's going to expand your project to places that you just didn't plan to go um, but I guarantee you if you do go there it will be well worth it but for it to be well worth it for you you have to factor in the potential for scope creep and to ensure that there's enough budget um, available right to, to to tackle that scope creep mm -hmm. yes, Thank yes. You. and an example of that is we um opened up a different component of filemaker to our external partners and what we did is we designed um investigations forms that they could work on a web-based version of our database separate from our client database did not require individual licenses for all of these users because then you get into the cost of licenses um so essentially now we have all investigators from all four agencies working on one form on a web-based form which we immediately receive once they submit it and complete it mm -hmm. so even though they work for other agencies we've been able through this project to bring them more under our umbrella for lack of a better term. You'll also want to create buy-in with them, um, mm -hmm. but also internal buy-in as well. I don't know if your uh, situation is like ours, but as Heidi mentioned, we're working with three other agencies. So one of the other challenges that we had was getting those other agencies to buy into the fact that we're just going to be using one centralized system now uh, to, to, to complete investigation reports. And then from there, of course, these, these, these reports can get, fee can get fed into their business systems but this idea that wow there's this one central location that they can all go to now was a little bit of a challenge for them at first but i think they all got it now right Hyde? yeah i think so for sure for mm -hmm. sure yep. um and I'll, I'll throw out a huge challenge for us which i don't think we have still yet fully solved is the challenge of migrating data from the old database to the new database and, and i i i am um, um, when I speak of the old database, DPPC's old system was actually a compilation of, I believe, 34 separate databases. Because wow. way back in the late 80s, FileMaker did not have relational tables. It was not a relational database. So every time we had a new process, someone would create a new database and they didn't all speak to each other. Mm -hmm. So the logistics of migrating information from 34 separate databases to a new single relational database has been really challenging. 
So we had to step back, uh, rethink what was important to migrate and maybe what wasn't as important to migrate. And we did a partial migration and we're still working and discussing what else would need to be migrated. Yeah. Uh, we, and we kind of have a workaround in that the developer built in a means for staff to connect directly to either the old system or the new system at the click of a button to just facilitate them toggling between both. You would you would think that with a project like this, you can start to say, well, we're gonna move forward and we won't need to look behind, but you may need to, right? So so don't discard your old data, certainly archive it, but, cert but you may come to a point where you have to be selective about what data you move over because um, moving data in itself can be very costly. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly make a make a business decision on the importance of whether that data should be moved forward or if we can con or, 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 if, or if you could continue from here on. Right. While still having access to the data before our developer did a fantastic job of, of making sure that we still have access to that data if we ever need to go back. Um, so it was yep. good of us to, to, to have, make sure that was incorporated as well. And I, I'd like to add one more challenge that we, we face, Heidi, is, 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 is really around stakeholder management. Um, it's, it's really important that you decide who your key stakeholders are, both from an operational to IT and to a low, lower, lower staff um, level. You know, everybody who's affected by this project needs to be involved. And even if, if you, you limit it just to your management, supervisor, and executive teams, you know, it's important that you also ask them for who they believe their key stakeholders are, key stakeholders are in their departments to help bring this project to fruition, right? So always create seats at the table for everyone whose hands are involved in a, in a, in a project of this magnitude. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in again. Um, Heidi, what are, what are the lessons learned? I know we, uh, you told me a couple of things, so I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, 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 to have you talk about your lessons learned. Sure, sure. Uh, as Jean mentioned, if possible, always budget for more than you expected um, because scope creep will happen. And again, there are things that you will not have thought of and you will realize there are some other improvements and efficiencies that you can make as you begin to learn more through this process and you'll wanna take advantage of them. And I remember back three years ago, probably Maria Green saying to me, make sure you build in a lot of IT hours. She said it to me, I don't know how many ways and she was so right. Um, you just need to really be clear in the amount of IT hours you need, but also the amount of resources and the amount of time commitment you're going to need from your staff, your own staff, from mm -hmm. you know all the various facets of operations. Yep. And again, yep. I would go back to the discovery process, be very, very thorough and very thoughtful after you discuss with all of your stakeholders and get your team, your doers at the table, be as thorough as possible during the discovery process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, another lesson that I believe was learned is when, when it comes to selecting a product, I mean, vet multiple products, but when you finally find the product and you believe it's the best product for your agency, your organization, trust that that product is gonna deliver on its promise to give you what you need. Um, but more importantly, right, is to trust the business leaders, the operational leaders in the position to deliver this product home, okay? Um, it's not gonna be an easy ride, it's gonna be bumpy because you're essentially rebuilding uh, a home. <laughs> you're rebuilding a, a brain in a way, right? Uh, you're reconstructing um, a, 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 an organic, an organic um, structure in a way, all right? It's, it's all happening and, and, and transforming right before you, um, but your leaders, your business leaders, your operational leaders, and your IT leaders are all gonna help deliver this home. So make sure you, 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 know, you deliver confidence in, in them so that they can make that happen. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Gene. And, and I think for us, I think we were lucky it wasn't necessarily a lesson learned. I think we were very, very fortunate in that we um, entered uh, into a relationship with 
in or a company that that's all they do is FileMaker. They are FileMaker specialists. And I think we've been very lucky to build the relationship we have with them. Um, so, you, you know, you need to find the right vendor. You need to find the right developer uh, to help you with your project. And, and we did discuss, you know, getting buy-in and having all the people uh, at the table. But I think for me, a lesson learned is while you want the right people at the table, don't have more than necessary because that complicates the development process. I think you have to have some control over what gets presented to the developer because the more people in the kitchen, the more expensive it gets and the more development hours you're going through. Heidi, that, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, um, just be on the lookout for that because you need to build in a system to manage all the requests that are going to come in, and those requests have to be filtered. Okay, and it doesn't mean that all requests will. It doesn't mean that every request that comes in will be fulfilled. Okay, um, but the greater whole, the greater picture of these requests needs to be fulfilled because those pieces are are vital, are critical to the success of the project. Right. Mm -hmm. And if time permits or if budget permits, those those other additional requests um, could could potentially be revisited. Right. But it's important that um, one of the lessons I believe I learned um, through this is is delivering on your communication. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, you've heard it time and time again that you need to communicate. Well, with a project like this, you really need to over communicate. Um, even if it includes holding town halls, uh, the emails that you send, you contact the people directly um, via phone or the people who are affected directly by the business process, asking if, them, if they understand it or if they understand the, the, the recent change that was made and how it affects them. Sometimes you have to hold the person's hand and bring them to the to the to the table and say, "Hey, let's discuss this because this is going to be a huge impact on your business processes." So always overly communicate, no matter what, uh, because the more people who can understand what's going on and how it impacts them, the greater of a success this project will be as you yeah. go into it. Very Did you all have any enhancements, Heidi and and Jean? Say that again, Philip. Do you all have any enhancements after you all have? Uh, implemented your your solution we're actually still we haven't yet put a pin in it to tell you the truth because uh, you know uh, the this portion of our grant is complete but we have been fortunate to have some money in our budget to continue with some additional development and we are continuing to build enhancements because we've found it to be such a fantastic solution for us and it's like okay what else can it do for us how else can we improve efficiencies for the investigators or for our um, oversight officers? What can we do to just improve operations overall? And we're actually, just today we had a meeting, we're going to build a new uh, component to this database to track all of our trainings and outreach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're doing such a large volume of trainings to, to, to you know various stakeholders that we wanna have one, one single place to track all of these and this will be a great place to do it and to be able to maybe link it to a particular investigation that resulted in possibly a recommendation for training yeah, so yeah. there are always enhancements we, we haven't haven't really wrapped it up with a bow yet Philip yeah but but Philip just so you can understand like um, the, the project is, is, is really near completion it's mm -hmm. just with the additional funding that we have and the additional options that or the flexibility the product allows we're just like hey maybe we can add this addition or this type of enhancement or this type of uh, improvement you know Heidi didn't mention it but one of the other things that we recently rolled out was our online reporting this was not something that was available um, before to us all the reports used to come in via phone and written now it comes in via web and written and phone, right? Um, it's it's a fantastic product because of the flexibility it allows us to scale. One of the mm -hmm. biggest thing is is you want a database product that's going to allow you to scale as your business needs grows and changes. Right. Um, so be flexible with your selection. One of the things that we learned, um, you may not know it now. You might say, "Hey, I want the product to do exactly what it does now, but better." But you need to define better. And if you can't define better, 
go into um, a project like this with the hopes that better, whatever is delivered in the form of a technology, affords you the flexibility to expand it and change it on the fly. Um, also, find a product that will allow for easy transfer you know, uh, easy, easy knowledge transfer. So essentially when we officially wrap this up and put the bow on it, as Heidi mentioned, um, some of the changes Heidi and I will be able to go in and do them. And I'm not a developer, you know, if I need to change a value list, I'll be able to go do that. If I need to add, um, like an additional check option here, I'll be able to go do that. Certainly there are some more advanced features we'll have to contract our developer for, but the product, is designed to allow the end user to make uh, surface level changes that doesn't affect the the full architecture of the uh, of the solution. But once again, if that's needed, we can build that into any service service contract that we have or maintenance contract that we have with our developer going forward. Um, but I'll tell you, um, it's 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 been an exciting project to be part of, and seeing how it's come to fruition and how easy people are using it now because they've been using it for a while has been has been marvelous to see. Yeah, and I, I want to also go back to um, something Philip had mentioned earlier, and we learned from our prior experience with our old system how to control data because of the the errors that we saw. So we built those controls in, you know, folks are choosing from a value list of cities and towns. Folks are entering a zip code and it's, you know, like most systems do pre-populating the town. We have more controls in place to control bad data. And I also okay. want to go back to, to Jean's point on communication. If there is one lesson, I think that would be it, is communication, 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 and recognizing that frontline staff especially are experiencing a lot of anxiety over this major change. And, and I think, you know, over communication helps reduce some of that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, I'm going to, I wanted to make sure we get it, uh, enough time in for question and answer. I'll turn it back over to, uh, to our moderator to uh, moderate the questions. Certainly, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so now is the time to ask questions. If you have them, you can type them in the questions box um, and we will get to them in turn. So one question um, from someone in the audience, how do we decide what to make required and what to make optional fields in our system? Any advice on what should be a required field or an optional field? Well, from, from oh, sorry, my experience, so, oh, okay, how do you can go on? No, I just, from my experience, and, I, I, and I'm speaking because we recently just rolled out our online reporting forms, um, it would be nice to have a lot of field validation and have many fields required, but you have to really recognize, is it possible that that information will always be available? And we don't want to, the staff to get stuck mm -hmm. in, you know where they can't move forward so you i just from my experience you have to be really careful which fields you want to force to be required and i would get input from front frontline staff on that and how it's going to impact their workflows good advice and I, I, I would also say um just to add to what heidi is as has just mentioned is assess your, your you know your, your business processes and your workflows um decide what is required for the work to be completed. Yeah, we don't want think you don't want your staff to be stuck, but in order to move the the report forward or the process forward, um, what's that specific requirement that is that that is absolutely needed um, to prevent the user from having to go back and get it? Yeah. Great, Philip. Did you have anything to add, or do you think they covered it? No, I think they did an excellent job, and especially with with. Um, with adding your process in. So in terms of your process being um, the, the driver of your requirement, what, what makes your process work would be what I would say to as, as a required field. Um, one question for, for Heidi and Jean, um, cause it sounds like your software handles quite a few tasks um, and uh, this may not apply to you, but if you have a registry, does the software handle the um, registry entries as well? Interesting. <laughs> that was another enhancement that we hadn't expected. Um, 
for those of you that are aware or not, uh, DPPC, there was a law that just went into effect at the end of July, where DPPC is now hosting uh, an abuser registry. Um, and we have a separate uh, product, uh, a separate platform that actually houses the registry where people go in to check the registry. But as far as the workflow and the registrable abusers that we track, that is all done within our FileMaker uh, database. Mm. We're flagging them. Uh, we have certain notifications that we are required to send out when someone is either found guilty of registrable abuse or the petitions and the appeals and all of that. All of that we built and is being tracked in our new database. And that was an enhancement that we were not expecting. And we built mm -hmm. up over the last few months. Sure. I also want to add um, to follow up with what Heidi mentioned. Our product was actually so, was one of the so one of the products we were looking for to house the full uh, registry. However, um, once again, because of of this decentralized IT state that that the the Commonwealth is sort of in, we wanted to integrate with a different business system at a partnering agency, and our, we had limitations with our product to do that. Um, so we end up going with a different product, but we c came to learn that um, um, the the different agency just didn't want to play 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 ball in a way. Um, they were going through a um, uh, um, a transfer of their um, systems from AWS to, Am to 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 Microsoft, and they could not take on the additional task of helping us integrate with them. Mm -hmm. So um, the deciding factor was around that why we did not select um, our existing application, our existing database application to fully um, um, build out this registry in it. Uh, so we went elsewhere. Gotcha. Right, but our database actually houses the information that gets pushed to this to other system. Um, yep. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I know about half the states or close to half the states have some sort of abuse, um, perpetrator uh, abuse registry. So I thought that might be a good one to ask. Um, and then another question that just occurs to me that didn't come from our audience, because here at the APS TARC, we've had a few questions about assimilating um, certain assessment tools or embedding certain assessment tools into software. Did you have any experience with that where you wanted to actually put in a, um, an assessment tool that your field people would use to assess abuse or cognitive status or what have you? We do have um, an assessment tool that is built into our intake form. So we actually didn't mention we, um, DPPC is, is responsible for a 24 seven uh, hotline to report abuse. And after hours and on holidays, we contract with a vendor who answers our hotline for us. Mm. They are also working in a web direct version of our database. So when they get a, a, a call, someone reports abuse, they enter it onto the, a web, web based uh, version. And we, are immediate, we have immediate access to that information. So if it's an emergency after hours, we see it live, which is oh. a huge improvement over what we had. But at, on all of our intake forms where folks are, are, are documenting the report of abuse, at the very tail end of that intake is an assessment tool to assess risk and determine um, what actions need to be taken, you know, how soon we need to, to respond, et cetera. That's part of our intake form. Yeah. Heidi, we, we also built in um, and how do you, you'll be better able to help me deliver this information, but when, when the intake form is being completed, depending on the type of abuse you select, right, it, it mm -hmm. gives you specific questions that you could, you could ask the caller. Um, is that correct, Heidi, if I'm saying it correctly? Like, yeah, so we, we have um, scripted Thank different you. scripts be, depending on the nature of the abuse being reported. Thank you. So depending on what the type of abuse is being reported as the operator or the, the hotline specialist clicks this type of abuse, it opens up a particular set of scripted questions. Yeah. You know? um, so that was part of this, this build as well. So I hope that helps with the assessment question. That's what I wanted to tie in. 
Oh, very interesting. Um, let's see, here is a question for one of our participants. Is the intake form completed by the public or is it just internal? So we, we have our own intake form where our staff are entering information from a phone call, but we also just opened up on our website about two weeks ago, online forms where people can submit those forms online, they complete it, and we see it live on our end once it's submitted. Great. But there is a statutory requirement of mandated reporters to make an oral report to us. So the expectation is that they call the hotline and then they follow up with a written report. Oh, and folks okay. actually print out a PDF and, and write on it, you know, handwrite on it, <laughs> like, you know, the old school days. And now they can just go into this form and complete it, hit submit, and it comes to us. Great. But they are not working in our system. They're working in, again, a, a web-based version of it that then pushes to us. We validate the information and bring it into our system. So it's really improved or increased our efficiency in that we're not retyping information. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions from our attendees, so I think we may be done with Q and A. Um, if we can go to the last slide, um, just so there are. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one more slide. Um, there is our contact information. You have our website there. You also have the email address where you can reach out to us. But you can get to us by um, going to our contact us page on the website that you see right here. And if you don't have a chance to jot it down, you can just Google APS TARC, T-A-R-C, and find us that way. Um, reach out to us at any time if you have any questions about your formula grant work or other work that you're doing in Adult Protective Services. That's where we are here. We're here to help you in any way we possibly can. So um, thanks so much to our presenter, Philip Calloway, and our panelists. Jean Frejust and Heidi Cresta today. We really appreciate all the information you've imparted on our attendees. And have Indeed, a great I Yeah, offer, sure. Offer us up if anyone has any questions or they think of something after this webinar, they are more than welcome to reach out to me or to Jean for if they're Absolutely. thinking of embarking on an endeavor like this. We're happy to talk to them. Great. Thank you for that offer. And you can reach them by reaching us if you want to. You can reach yes. out to the APS TARC and we will forward it on to um, to Jean and Heidi and you can learn from their experience. Thanks for that. We appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, I think at this point, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And we'll talk to you soon on another webinar. Great. Thank you.